Um, good evening, everyone. Uh, this is Mike Sarnowski with uh, Special Olympics Maryland. Uh, as I mentioned a couple of minutes ago, uh, Melissa Anger is on the phone. However, she has laryngitis and uh, has a big two-day basketball tournament this weekend. And so we're going to um, see if we can't make it so that she does not have to speak uh, uh, or uh, speaks as little as she needs to uh, so that she can um, preserve her voice for the weekend. Uh, Neil Coffey is, uh, will be joining us. Uh, let me just check. Neil, are you on the line yet? Well, we do expect him to be joining us uh, momentarily. So uh, Neil will chime in as we go through. Uh, hopefully, uh, everybody sees our the top slide. Melissa, is that what you're seeing? The main, the first slide. Yes, it's still it's the cover page. Okay, now I have two screens, and just want to make sure the right one's showing. So, um, as I mentioned uh, um, uh, just before we started, uh, we have a new audio system for our webinars. Uh, that actually makes recording them and uh, managing them somewhat easier. Uh, <clears throat> but it does mean uh, folks come in with their phones muted. Um, we certainly do want to get your questions and your comments and such, uh, but to do it, it's just a little bit different. Uh, all of you should see a control panel uh, on your desktop with your webinar. Uh, if you have a question or a comment, there's two ways that you can uh, contribute to them. One, you can go to the question box and just type your question in. Melissa will be, uh, since she can't speak uh, or not speak much, um, she'll handle um, answering some questions, but then also, um, if need be, she'll, uh, she'll break that rule and, and read your question out for the group, uh, and we'll try to get you an answer that way. The other option is also on that control panel. You should see a little symbol that has a um, thing that looks like you're raising or that has your hand uh, that's basically that's exactly what it's called it's raising your hand uh, and a little thing will pop up on Melissa's um, screen and uh, that will signal to her that you have a question to ask uh, and she will uh, find the right uh, moment to ask us to pause uh, and she'll unmute your phone and you can ask your question uh, so that said um, uh, let's dive right in uh, and let me check one more time if Neil's joined us as yet. I'm here, Mike. Great. Okay. Um, so we'll go through. Uh, we're going to go through some administration, some deadlines, uh, coach requirements, and such. Uh, the venue for the summer games, of course, we'll be using lots of venues throughout the season. Uh, Neil will cover the events and the order of events. Uh, there's a couple new rules, and actually get your input on um, a couple events that have been added to the rules. Uh, for those of you who don't know, the 2016 rules from Special Olympics uh, Incorporated or International were um, issued or released in August, so after our summer games, uh, but they are the new rules, uh, so we'll be looking at them here. Um, luckily for aquatics, there's only a handful, uh, and actually one of them is that it's no longer called aquatics, it's now called swimming. Uh, we'll talk through the qualifiers that are available, some resources, um, and so on down the line. Uh, Sorry. Moving ahead, just a reminder, everyone I hope is aware of this, um, but no athlete or volunteer can participate in any way in Special Olympics uh, without a current uh, medical form or if they're a volunteer, a volunteer application. That does mean that if an athlete or a volunteer or unified partner who is a type of volunteer uh, attends your program and they don't have an up-to-date medical uh, or an up-to-date volunteer application, they cannot participate. There's no grace period of, uh, well, you can, you can uh, swim for the first two practices and then you have to get your medical in. You can't even swim for the first practice and get your medical in. Uh, they have to have the medical valid uh, and ready to go at the beginning of the season before they get in. And this applies to all sports. It's not just swimming. There's no change. There's nothing new with that. So um, that said, uh, we point that out because there may be a little bit of confusion with one of the things that's on here. So these are the deadlines for uh, all summer game sports for 2017. Uh, those of you who get the uh, bi-weekly area memo have seen these dates numerous times uh, and um, sharing them here with you. One of the key things to remember here is that the date that is showing is the date by which the information actually needs to be in either our computer system at headquarters 
uh, that's known as GMS, uh, or if it's a paperwork or form, that form needs to be at headquarters. Um, since all of these things you need to do through someone in your county. Yeah, you, uh, most of you as coaches don't have access to GMS. Some of you I know do GMS for your county, uh, but for those of you who don't, um, you're going to need to work out with whoever handles that for your county uh, to get the information to them uh, to make sure that they have the time to get it in to uh, the system. Uh, so um, uh, if, it, if the training registration is due by April 20th, um, talk to whoever is handling that for you for your county. If you don't know who it is, contact your area director or your sport coordinator uh, in your county and they can tell you. It's uh, quite possible that that person may need it a week or more earlier than that date. Um, so make sure you work it out with them. It's grossly unfair to that volunteer for you to give it to them on the deadline and expect them to turn it around unless you've made that arrangement with them in advance, of course. So uh, four different deadlines that apply to aquatics. Uh, the first one, uh, the training registration deadline, and all none of this is new. Any of you have been around, that this is uh, uh, the same type of thing that we've done every year. Uh, but the training registration deadline is the date by which everyone who is participating in your training program needs to be registered in GMS. That's all your athletes, all your coaches, all your unified partners, all your volunteers, so on down the line. And that establishes the roster of uh, participants or individuals who are eligible uh, to potentially go or uh, participate at summer games. You can certainly add additional folks after that time, uh, assuming you have um, uh, the, uh, the spacing and the capacity in your program to do so. Um, and they certainly should get added into GMS. We need to get everybody listed in there who does participate in any way in your program. Uh, but if they're added after April 20th, they just wouldn't be eligible for summer games. Um, and that happens all the time. Many of you know that I, uh, uh, as a volunteer, put a volunteer hat on. I still coach track and field as well as soccer. We always have, with either of those programs, some folks who show up or join the program after that deadline. And we just tell them ahead of time or when they join that, hey, you know, you're welcome to come. You can go to some of the competitions that we've got, so on down the line. Uh, but you just wouldn't be eligible to compete at summer games. Um, and that's, uh, that's typically fine for most folks. Um, so after that deadline, as I mentioned, no one can participate without a medical, but we also recognize that you may have athletes show up on the first day of practice and have their new medical in hand uh, or uh, whenever their first practice is that they've got, or they may have a medical that's good, but it expires during the season and they may give you a replacement medical. So we give you, that's roughly 10 days uh, or a little more after the, um, Actually, it's about two weeks after the uh, training registration deadline to get in any outstanding medicals or volunteer forms. Uh, and by that date, every athlete needs to have their medical in, and that medical needs to be valid through June 11th, which is the last day of summer games. Um, so just uh, uh, the, the, if, uh, if, if their medical expires um, you know, June 1st, you still need to get that new medical in that's good through summer games in uh, no later than May 4th. Um, we, we aren't allowing medicals or any forms to expire mid-season and get replaced at that point. Um, for all coaches, partners, volunteers, uh, anybody who else, a uh, non-athlete who's involved with your program, they need to have their volunteer application and their protective behavior certification, again, valid through summer games, uh, uh, in by that date. Uh, all coaches, that's head coaches, as well as assistant coaches, need to have their concussion certification uh, completed and submitted uh, to headquarters by that date. Uh, and then all coaches, um, their coach certification needs to be, their sports certification needs to be done uh, by that date. We've talked about the sports certification for several years, uh, and it's kicking in for all coaches now. Uh, we have given you plenty of warning on that uh, for the last year or more that it was uh, likely to start coming in. So. Um, again, all that needs to be taken care of by May 4th. Uh, we have on, a, on another slide somewhere here, I believe, that by the end of March, we will send out uh, to coaches who participated in last year's summer game sports um, their status, uh, and we'll provide that also to the area leaders uh, so that you can at least have a sense of that. Um, and of course, if you do have people registered already for those summer game sports or for aquatics or swimming, I'm sorry, oops, I haven't gotten used to the new term. Uh, by, uh, by the time we pull that list, we'll include uh, the folks that are in for this year as well. 
So you've got the registration and you've got the forms in. The competition registration deadline is May 22nd. That's the date by which all uh, athletes and unified partners, everybody who is competing, needs to be in their competitive events and they need to have an entry score uh, for that competitive event. Um, in addition, they need to be on teams uh, as well. Um, if, they're, if they're in a relay team, that team needs to be created in GMS. I'm not going to go through how you do that. Your GMS person has been trained on that, uh, but that's the date by which all that needs to be in. You can certainly get it in sooner uh, than that. Uh, in addition, if anybody hey, here is a GMS person, uh, just a second, um, we'll, uh, uh, we can talk you through um, how to request us to advance individuals from competition so you're not entering things in two or three times. Uh, Melissa, it sounds like you have a question. Yes, uh, we have Sean Lloyd raised his question about something that you said, raised his hand about something that you said. So okay. I'm going to unmute his phone. Sean, go ahead. You should be able to talk. Um, where can I find the uh, protective behaviors so I can pass it on to the people that involved? We need it. Um, what you can do is you can, uh, if you can wait just a moment, uh, that's about one or two slides after this, or it might, it, it will, we'll have all, we'll have all the stuff for that, uh, that we'll cover later tonight. Okay, okay. Thank you. As the link, same thing goes for the concussion. So, um, we'll, we'll show that to you. I forget exactly where it is in the deck. Um, here it's, it's for different sports. We put it at different places, but great question. Glad that you're anticipating that. So, <laughs> Uh, I should also say with that, your person in your uh, county who has access to GMS or the people uh, who have access to GMS can also look up and see what the status is of anybody in your county um, as well in terms of all that stuff. So anyway, so again, the competition registration date deadline is May 22nd. Um, and then because we know for both uh, swimming and for athletics, uh, there are still competitions going on. Folks could have their um, uh, have, have submitted a score uh, well before the May 22nd deadline for competition, um, but they they may get some additional competition time in uh, after that. So you have until May 30th to get in any updates, any improvements on their score on your scores for that. Um, that is important to get in because we do have what we call a maximum effort rule, uh, an athlete. Um, who performs or a relay team that performs significantly better than what their entry score was could potentially be disqualified um, uh, for that. So we're not going to go into the details on that tonight, but bottom line is you should have your best score for your athletes in. So if you do have a score improvement, uh, you can get that uh, by May 30th. Uh, that's when that needs to be sent in to us. Uh, your GMS people will actually be locked out of making changes uh, to uh, their data, so you'll just send it in to um, a designated individual at our headquarters, typically your regional sports director, and they'll take care of updating that score. Anyway, so going ahead. Uh, hey, Mike, we have another question or okay. another raised hand. Uh, Scott, go ahead. Uh, with regard to the coaching certification uh, for a specific sport, do the assistant coaches also have to have that? Anybody Is that what I'm reading? Yes, anybody who is a coach now uh, needs to do that. Okay, yes. thank you. We phased that in. I mean, the real rule is that all coaches do that. For the last three years or so, we phased it in um, with head coaches only, and uh, uh, we'll uh, be doing it for all coaches. Uh, as we mentioned at another um, uh, uh, webinar, um, how closely we police that particular one. All the forms, I guarantee you, we'll be, we'll be policing very tightly. Um, here we do have some wiggle room if there's a special situation. Um, I, mean, I don't, don't want to give you a door that everybody's going to drive a truck through here in terms of uh, some leeway. Um, but uh, if there's a special situation, talk to us and we can uh, see what we can do. So anyway, uh, moving along because we do I want to be sure we don't go longer than the hour. Um, uh, so again, this just reminds you to talk to your area leadership about stuff. One thing to note, and we will not go through these in detail, but there are new medical forms uh, and new volunteer applications uh, that are in use. They were issued uh, the middle or the summer, uh, last summer. Uh, we have copies of those in the resource or the reference section in the slide deck that you'll get uh, either tonight or tomorrow uh, with the link to the recording. 
Um, any new medicals, any new volunteer applications should be using the new form. Your folks who have existing medicals that are still good do not need to replace them, but any new ones coming in, excuse me, uh, need to be using the new forms. Uh, coach requirements, just as a reminder, this kind of summarizes what I just spoke through. Um, but for all your coaches, they need to have their class A or their volunteer screening, uh, which all of them, uh, that's the standard volunteer screening that you do, uh, the protective behaviors, the concussion training, uh, and their sports certification, all of which are valid for three years. And as a reminder, your unified partners and any other volunteers need to have the first two items there. They need to have the class A volunteer screening as well as the protective behaviors. It's not going to hurt for them to do the concussion training. Uh, but it's just not a requirement. It's also not going to hurt them to do the coach sports certification, uh, but the, um, uh, the concussion training is uh, completely free, um, and it's kind of interesting and entertaining if, you've, uh, if you haven't seen it yet. Um, so here, uh, this goes through the concussion training. I'm not going to read it to you. Uh, bottom line is we recommend using the um, CDC, uh, Center for Disease Control, uh, heads up concussion uh, training, it takes about 30 minutes, it's free. There's the link uh, you go through and then just send in, um, you, you basically imprint or uh, save a PDF certificate and you just send it into coaches at somd.org. Again, you will get this um, slide deck uh, uh, with uh, uh, either later tonight or tomorrow uh, with this information on it. We'll also include that when we send it out for anybody who doesn't have concussion. Should also note, given when this was started, the concussion training, no one who's done it already um, should be expiring. I think we've got another year before anybody will anybody's uh, concussion certification will be expiring. So um, if you've done it already, uh, you're definitely good through this year. For protective behaviors, so this answers Sean's question. Um, uh, again, this is required. We do need it for all volunteers. Um, there's the link. It takes about 10 minutes. It's pretty quick and simple. In theory, we get uh, information on this um, that you've completed it. We have found over the last several weeks that several people have indicated that they've completed it, uh, but we don't have any record of it. So what we recommend is you get a little email that confirms that you've completed it. Just forward it on to Rachel Maddock or at rmaddock at smd.org, and that's just kind of a little extra um, coverage, if you will, to make sure that it comes in. Um, but it's pretty quick, it's pretty simple, um, and you just need to do it every three years. Uh, I know that this has, this is, you know, kind of bureaucratic, I apologize for that, uh, but with any organization, uh, particularly any organization that works with at-risk populations, we need to be careful and uh, um, this really protects uh, you as a coach and uh, our insurance. So, um, so anyway, now going in, uh, that for the most part, other than us flying through you seeing the copies of the medicals, the new medicals, that should handle most of the paperwork. Um, so hopefully everybody's familiar, uh, or who, at least if you were with us last year, we are over at Loyola Blakefield again uh, this year. Uh, we would certainly like to get your feedback uh, on that, not at the moment, don't everybody start buying in with hands raised, uh, but uh, this uh, after this year, um, we should once again have access to, <coughs> excuse me, uh, the pool at Burdick Hall, and we need to look at uh, whether the um, uh, whether we want to um, have aquatics there uh, or see if we continue the partnership or the relationship with Loyola Blakefield. Um, there's certain benefits and such. Uh, one of the one of the challenges, uh, not that it's insurmountable by any means, is the use of Loyola Blakefield is a, a bit more expensive than uh, the use of um, uh, the pool at Burdick, but um, uh, as we go through the season and particularly at summer games, let us know your thoughts. Uh, and uh, again, we'll be looking at, uh, but at 2017, we will be at Loyola Blakefield and we can look at 2018 uh, uh, at that time or shortly thereafter. Uh, for those of you who aren't familiar, the, the, the pool deck itself is huge. It's beautiful. The staging area, um, I know that we were kind of working through it and how to use it and traffic flow last year, I think by Sunday things worked out pretty well, um, but we'll talk more of that, about that and parking and some of the other issues and challenges that we had when we get to the pre-competition webinar. We just wanted to remind folks that this is where we'll be. Uh, I should also note that um, the details are on another slide, 
but uh, this is also the location of a coach training that's uh, being held on Sunday, this coming Sunday. Um, I think uh, Rob Dobry and uh, Matt um, McMullen, or uh, I forget Matt's last name, at uh, Loyola Blakefield will be doing a coach's training on Sunday. But we'll have a couple more details. I know we've got, I think, uh, a dozen or so folks already signed up for that. So, uh, swimming, uh, Neil, did you want to talk through this? And Neil, you may be muted. Sorry, I hit the wrong one. I, un I took it off the speaker and un didn't unmute. So, um, do you want to talk about the entries process, Mike, and I'll go over the order of events? Okay, that's fine. Um, so, uh, entries process uh, hasn't changed since last year. Um, they're, uh, to be eligible to compete at Summer Games, uh, there's another slide that also goes into this a little bit more. Uh, they need to participate in at least two qualifying swimming competitions, one of which, uh, as we'll note elsewhere, needs to be a multi-county event. Uh, I don't think anybody's had really any issue with that. Um, uh, there are uh, several opportunities for that, uh, but um, one uh, could potentially be an in-house qualifier, if you will. All of them need to be sanctioned. Uh, it's a simple process. Your area leaders know how to go through that. Um, but uh, you do need to go to at least two. Um, uh, athletes can enter in up to four events. That's three individual events and one relay, or two individual events and two relays. Um, uh, of course, the relays, uh, they can't be in the, on, on two relay teams within the same event. Same thing would go for the unified partners as well. They can't be on two relay teams within the same event. Um, if there are special circumstances, uh, such as variations on stroke uh, or other things like that. They need to be legitimate. Um, uh, your, um, uh, and some examples there, but, uh, exception to a standard stroke. Uh, we do want to know if uh, the athlete will need to use a lift um, or needs to have an external lane. Uh, this is not for convenience. This is based on an actual need, so please um, be, be uh, judicious in, in asking that. Um, we may follow up and ask some questions uh, in some cases if need be. Uh, if you do need uh, that type of thing, your area's GMS manager will need to put them in. There's a comments field for each of their competitive events, and they will need to put them in that, uh, the note of that in each, uh, in the comments field for each event. Um, we'll give them reminders uh, on doing that. Um, and like I say, before it's approved or we're just putting the note in there doesn't necessarily mean that it's definitely okay, um, uh, but we'll follow up uh, if, we, if we need to. So and, and as it's noted there, don't just assume that because um, uh, an athlete has always had this accommodation in the past that everybody just knows they need it. Uh, it needs to be noted in there uh, so that the folks on the deck can actually uh, keep track of it. And, and, and if, I can add, if I can add... If I can add something to that, Mike, um, we rely heavily on those comments. Um, one of the things that we do when we prepare the division and lane assignment information is we tend, we, out of fairness, we will block out the individual athlete's names. So we're not looking to see, you know, this person uh, has visual impairment, needs this, this person needs a lift, unless it's in that comment because we don't know the names of the individuals when we're preparing the division and lane assignment. So it is critical that it be there because otherwise we show up on Saturday and we have coaches coming to us and saying, you know, I need this and I need that. And at that point, the pool's already set, the meet's already, you know, ready to go. And it's not fair to anyone to expect a change, but it's also not fair to the athlete that that information wasn't entered in the first place. So let's make sure that that information be there. Yeah, and I should note, if folks don't realize that those comments What's put in there, um, unless we delete them because we were determined not to be legitimate, but um, those comments actually print out on the heat sheets that are used on the deck. Uh, so it is absolutely essential that they be on there. Hey, Mike, we actually have another question. Raise hand. Uh, Sean, go ahead. Um, I have a question on circumstances because my athletes have run into it in the past. They have no need for an outside lane normally, but none of them really can get out of the pool without the ladder, which can, which is a problem in the relays because they can't get out. And one at all, there's no way we can get her out without the ladder, using the ladder. 
And so if they're in the middle lane with the relay and she's not the end swimmer, there's no way we can get her out of the water while the other swimmers are finishing. I don't know how to handle that. Usually what happens there is, you know, as part of the instructions and part of the, the practice is, you know, just have the athlete move over in the lane to clear the wall for the other swimmers who are still coming in. Because... Yeah, that's, that's not... And I'm fine with that. Just they've been told, they've been told in the last couple of years that they're not allowed to get in the water to for their next start, and they they can't get in the water because the other swimmer's not out yet, and it really confuses my athletes. I, I think that, you know, getting getting in the water, you can do that in, in anticipation of the next, uh, you know, unless the athlete's starting from the, if the athlete is not starting from the block, then you can get in the water in anticipation of that person coming in. You know, obviously you need to pay attention to the touch and then the release of the next swimmer. But Right, that, it's the people it. on the deck keep stopping them from doing it. Somebody on the deck tells them they can't get in the water. We'll, we'll address that with the volunteers on the pool deck. Thank you. We actually have one more question. Uh, Carl, go ahead. Yeah, I, I just wanted to get a clarification on the eligibility part. Um, you had said that they have to have two qualifying swimming competitions. Does that have to be two individual swimming competitions, or can it be a individual and a relay to qualify for the two events? They need to be at two separate uh, events. So... Um, they would be, that would be two different days, if you if that's the easiest way to look at it. Going to a swim meet, uh, making this up, I don't know what who your athlete or where your athletes are entered, but it could be going to the Loyola swim meet, uh, and then going to one that's hosted by Prince George's County. Or, oh, okay, I got you. I, I was a little confused at, for the eligibility part. I'm okay now. Okay. I'm clear. Yeah, yeah. So, okay. Okay. Great. Moving ahead, uh, Neil, we're at the uh, event slide. Okay. Um, listed in front of you on the first slide are all the events that we add or that we, we are in offering. Um, there are a, some additional events. And, and, Mike, do you want to talk about that? The, the, the three, there's two additional events that we found out about recently. Uh, actually, we'll touch on that uh, in, I think, it's two slides where we okay, can get great. their feedback. Okay, okay. That, that's wonderful because that's what I wanted us to do tonight. So you're looking at, at the first slide, we'll show you the swimming events. Um, and then the next slide down will show you um, the order of events that we're offering, um, how we're putting these together. I will say this, uh, by and large, we were pleased with the order that we had last year in 2016. So we made some slight modifications to it um, rather than completely reinventing it. So. Um, the, the highlight on those changes, um, we, we swapped out the 1500 free and the 800 free as the first event on Saturday and Sunday. Um, we just found that Saturday tends to run a little bit long, so we started with the 800 free and so the 1500 to, you know, perhaps add a little time into the schedule. Um, we moved the 4 by 200 free to go before the 400 free. Um, because we had some issues with perhaps athletes, um, you know, having some conflict, and then we tried to space apart the 400 IM, the 200 free, and the 200 breast on Sunday, just because there could be, um, you know, same athletes in each of those. We were trying to move those a little bit farther apart uh, to give some rest and award time, but you know, given the, the the fewer events on Sunday, that was a little bit difficult to move them completely far apart. So and also, that's the for, highlights of the major changes. Um, and um, for anybody who is a new coach or a newer coach, um, uh, one of the reasons that Neil, like, again, tonight's event or tonight's webinar is not all about the summer games, and you should be looking at training your athletes, you know, and picking the events based on what's best for them. Um, but, Neil, do you want to mention how this is helpful in terms of figuring out what events to enter them in uh, at summer games for anybody who's yeah, relevant? 
Absolutely, Mike. I mean, that, that's a really good point. You know, the reason, one of the reasons why we want everyone to have this um, this order of events well in advance is, um, like Mike is saying, if you know an athlete is going to swim certain events, you can take a look at this order and see, wow, you know, everything he or she is going to be in will happen Saturday morning, or it's all going to happen Saturday afternoon. So this kind of allows you to a little bit more strategically place, um, you know, the athletes and events that might be a little bit more distant apart. Um, you know, it might have multiple days. Um, you know, some athletes, you know, it just allows you to plan uh, a little bit better. It is really difficult for us to estimate how long one particular event will take. You know, that's going to be based upon the registration. So, you know, just because an event might be three or four items below something that preceded it doesn't mean it's going to be a large block of time if those three or four events are, you know, a 50 butterfly, which we only have, you know, 15 people in, and we get through it in five minutes. So it's hard to predict, but at least it gives you a little bit of layout to determine what, if you do have those choices for your athletes, um, you know, you can work with your coaches to kind of put the registration into events that are spaced a little bit more distant apart. Hey, guys, we actually have a couple hands raised. Okay. Uh, Leah, go ahead. Can you hear me? I don't know if there's something I have to do. Oh, hey, Leah, we can hear you. Okay, sorry. Um, did you get rid of the 10-meter 10, 10 assisted? The 10-meter assisted, I believe, is now the 15 assisted. Right, that was that's one of the rule changes. One of the rule changes from... It was the following slide. So the what's the difference between the unassisted and the assisted? Did, hello? Yeah, Neil, I need to defer to you on that. The, what's the difference between the 15 unassisted and the 15 assisted? Uh, it's whether you have someone in the water and not in the water with the athlete. Okay. Thank you. All right, uh, Brenna, oops, Brenna, uh, okay, Brenna, you should be able to speak now. Maybe not. Okay, uh, Sean, go ahead. Um, where can I find, um, documentation and regulations on what exactly the athlete can use in a flotation race? Uh, they're in the, uh, the swimming sports rules. They're, they're okay. Available. Never uh, been able to find them. Okay. Uh, we, we can include a link. I think actually there is a link further on down in there. They're on the Olympics website. Uh, and, um, yeah, if you haven't gone through and then, uh, Neil, um, I know the um, – the international governing body is FINA. Um, is the U.S. swimming the uh, NGV? That's correct, Mike. So the Special Olympics rules are adaptations of the national governing body or NGB rules. So you should definitely have a copy of uh, the U.S. swimming rules you can get from the U.S. swimming's website uh, and um, the Special Olympics rules you can get from the Special Olympics website. Uh, as well. Right. I have found all copies of the rules. What I haven't been able to find in them is specific, re specific regulations as to what devices are allowed as a flotation. Well, let, let, uh, Sean, we'll have to look at that and see. I'm almost certain that's in the Special Olympics rules. Okay. Uh, we'll check into that. Uh, I'll tell you what, um, for the moment, let's go ahead. Whoops. Uh, I'm going to jump ahead and then we'll come back to this rule reminder because we've talked through the rule changes a couple times and rather than uh, keeping it waiting. So um, just so the folks know, we have um, Special Olympics International um, uh, usually releases rule changes in like uh, early March time frame in 2016 for whatever reason, and it's every two years that their new rules come out. Uh, for whatever reason, they released the changes for 2016 in August uh, for all the sports at once. 
So there were, uh, I think, a total of three rule changes um, or groups of rule changes, if you will, uh, for uh, for what was known as aquatics. Uh, one, as you've noticed over here, was that it's changed to swimming. Uh, another, which doesn't really affect us because we've always been doing this, or not always, but for the last many years have been doing that, it actually makes it a rule about marking the bib number or the number for the athlete on their uh, on their upper arm uh, in permanent marker. Again, we've been doing that for years. The other was it eliminated uh, the 10 meter assisted swim and replaced it with a 15 meter assisted swim. Um, not sure about the rationale other than, um, I mean, I would be guessing as exactly why they made that change. The other was it ad they added two new events, um, the 25 meter kickboard and the 25 meter assisted swim. So Neil, do you want to talk about those and uh, how you, what feedback you want to get from folks? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we want to get a sense from you all um, if there is any interest in these new events, we know that you know the the training season has already begun. Um, we are happy to offer them, um, but before we insert them into the schedule, we just wanted to get a sense of the interest. Um, you know, because if, if these are going to be really well subscribed events, um, meaning a large number of athletes, we don't want to kind of shoehorn them in. Um, to an already busy schedule, so we kind of want to figure out the best place to, to strategically place them, um, but that would be based upon the interest level of uh, the, the area program. So that would be, if we can, doesn't necessarily have to be tonight, but you know, the sooner the better, if we get a sense of, of numbers from areas of how many athletes you think would be interested in, in these events, we can then determine when to place them in the schedule. Um, actually, I'll tell you what, what we can do, uh, I'm going to uh, apologize to Brenna and Carl and Leah who have their hands up at the moment. I'm going to put all the hands down. Um, and if you could, if you are interested in us adding, and let's just assume both of those events, because there's so many variations. If you are interested in us adding uh, these two new events into the schedule for 2017 Summer Games, you can certainly train your athletes in these and offer them locally as well. But um, to add them in there, if you could raise your hand, uh, that'll give us a quick visual of what we've got uh, and interest. Um, so just raise it and keep it up. Um, some folks have turned it on and turned it off. So just click on the, if you're interested, okay. Eh. Let's see, about six or seven out of the 25 folks. So there's some interest. Um, yeah. Uh, we can do a more formal thing, but at least that's kind of a, a finger in the wind uh, to get a sense of what the interest is. Uh, and folks, I'm going to go ahead and lower the hands again so that now um, any uh, any further questions, uh, you can raise your hand and Melissa will know that that means that you have a question. So, uh, hey, Neil, we actually had someone ask a question on the question portion. Um, about the 200, about the order of events, the 200 meter free is listed twice, once on Saturday and once on Sunday. Uh, it's on, it's a Sunday event. Sorry, it should not have been on the Saturday list. Okay, thank you. It's a, right now it's listed as the third event down on Saturday. All right, so we'll get rid right. of that. Okay. And Melissa, can you make a note to change uh, that in the slides before we send the slides out to folks then? Yes, I can do that. Um, okay. Uh, then other rules reminders, um, just for folks. Uh, again, use the rules. Know the proper stroke standards. They're all they are in the rules. <coughs> um, for competition setup, and this applies to any competitions that you're hosting, uh, even in-house competitions. And these are Special Olympics rules um, for the safety of your athletes and we, um, uh, that you need to adhere to them. Uh, one is that there should be at least one observer for every two swimmers during the competition. Uh, they specifically say for any swimmers who have seizures but uh, in the rules, but they really should be uh, one for every two swimmers in the competition. Um, lifeguards, you must have <laughs> at least one lifeguard for every 25 swimmers in the water. Um, that lifeguard can have no other responsibility at the event other than being a lifeguard. Um, 
and they must have their current lifeguard certificate, CPR certificate, and first aid certificate. Um, uh, starting line uh, needs to be marked. Uh, again, you can read through the rest of those there. Um, the other um, note, but I mean, the, the key thing is that safety. Uh, um, and also refer to that last bullet there, refer to the Special Olympics rules um, for required emergency procedures. Uh, they go into a little bit of detail in there. Um, I'm not sure when those were added in, but uh, they aren't new. Um, but having a written documented uh, procedure, and you should do this for your training program, quite frankly, as well, uh, but it's specifically for a competition. Um, but exactly what will happen um, and how you will handle um, any kind of an emergency procedure or emergency situation um, so that uh, you're not making it up when you're there. Um, so uh, please do uh, follow that and go through all that. Uh, the other um, is relays with a, um, this was a change in 2015 um, that the, uh, this is about alternates for relay teams. You can enter alternates uh, for relay teams. Uh, they should be slower than uh, the athletes uh, that they would be replacing. Um, keep in mind, if you put somebody faster in and that, te that team could be disqualified using under the, um, um, the um, maximum effort rule, uh, if they swim faster, uh, the, uh, whatever the cutoff happens to be, I think it's typically about 25% uh, that we use faster than um, uh, what their entry score was. Um, the, uh, there is timing we'll go in terms of when you can submit an alternate. Uh, we'll go over that when it comes time for the competition, uh, pre-competition webinar. Um, and typically what we do is you can register alternates for an event. Uh, in there, uh, and you can use them for any of your teams so that you can, if you're doing the 4x25, um, let's just keep it as a traditional 4x25. If you have two or three alternates, uh, they're there and available for any of your relay teams uh, to be used, uh, again, following all the other procedures there. Um, so it's the same process that we use for track, uh, and same process we use at Snowshoe as well. Any uh, for any event uh, where we have relays, we use that same basic process of uh, um, having them in there. Uh, keep in mind also, as I mentioned earlier, um, that uh, a relay team member can only be on one relay team uh, in a given event. Um, so they can't swim on two 4x25 relay teams. They can only swim on one. Um, the same would apply for any alternate uh, unified partners. And unified relays, of course, uh, if you need to replace a partner, you need to replace that person with a partner. It still needs to be two and two. Okay. Uh, hey, Mike, we have a few. Okay. Um, Carl, go ahead. Yeah, my, my question goes back to the schedule. Um, you got the Saturday date, you got the Sunday date, and then in between is a break. What is the break? Where Where does that time fit in? It's all Saturday. The break is a, like a lunch break on Saturday. So these two columns. Everything, everything down underneath of the break is going to happen. Yeah, this is all. This, these two columns are all Saturday. So these will go through. I mean, uh, the break is usually. You know, you, you guys usually kick off. Around oh, okay. The four by twenty free is going to come underneath the four by twenty-five unified medley. Right. Yeah. Just pick up this okay. column. Okay. Down. We don't want to make the type uh, six point and nobody can read it. Okay. Gotcha. Uh, Leah? Uh, what? What? You had a question, Leah? No. Oh, okay. Sorry, right, you had your hand raised, so. All right. Scott? Scott, did you have a question? Okay. All right. Um, it looked like Sean had a question, but I can't unmute him. Okay. Oh, oh go ahead, Mike. Okay. Um, so, but through that. I can unmute myself. Oh, okay. This is Sean. Okay. Um, it's a question about the bib numbers. Is there um, regulation as to which arm they go on? Actually, the regulation is both arms. Okay, thank you. Sure. I mean, 
even I'm not sure whether Neil, do you guys do both arms or just pick one? But the rule actually. We says usually so. pick one, but you know what? We should do both. Better idea. Yeah, I just have, asked because last year one of my athletes got flat because the arm we picked was not the arm the volunteer was looking for it on. Okay, we can get. And that's why we'll that's why we'll do both arms. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Um, not going to read through this uh, just as a, because actually a lot of it has to do with cheerleading and softball. <laughs> this is a generic slide for all summer sports. Uh, but just as a reminder, to qualify for the state tournament, you need to meet all the red registrations and deadlines, including getting your forms in. Um, you need to have the coach certifications taken care of, and then a minimum of two sanctioned qualifiers. As I noted before, one of those needs to be a multi-area qualifier. Uh, the other, I mean, ideally, um, again, this is me speaking as a coach, but also as a representative of Special Olympics. You should have your folks doing as many competitions as you can fit into the calendar and into the schedule. Um, for uh, uh, With track, uh, again, uh, as a track coach, we try to get our folks out to at least four or five competitions during the season, um, even hosting some in-house ones, as they're called, uh, when we need to. Um, but the minimum is at least one multi-area qualifier and at least one other qualifier. I would recommend a multi-area one. Uh, but if you need to do a single one just within your area, that's fine too. Um, but again, you're really doing um, it, it's better for your athletes to get as much competition experience. Plus, quite frankly, it's a heck of a lot more fun for them during the season. Um, also, that said, as noted at the last, um, exceptions are rare, um, particularly with a sport such as swimming as opposed to the outdoor sports. Um, we, we have uh, more exceptions requested for softball and uh, track and bocce um, because of rain outs, depending upon the season. Last year was particularly bad as far as uh, events getting rained out. Uh, but if there is a unique situation, um, you're, uh, you can request some type of an exception um, that needs to come from your area director. And I'll tell you up front, the first question that you're going to get asked is, what have you done to get the second uh, uh, a second qualifier in or a second competition in. Um, uh, you know, you need to put a, potentially put a little effort in on that. And I, I'm not saying any of you individually wouldn't do that, but we do get some requests in of, you know, we it's uh, May 1st and my second qualifier got canceled. I want an exception. Well, you know, you've got five, six weeks there to schedule something else. And I'm not kidding that's happened that people have asked that. You've got five or six weeks to do something about that. Um, uh, that would that and in those cases those are not accepted um, but in some cases there are truly unique situations um, and uh, uh, if that's the case we certainly will consider it uh, qualifiers again um, bottom line is you need to uh, emulate we say emulate the state level competition that's not because the state level is be all and end all but the state level uh, does have uh, follows the rules. It has official certified officials and judges, trained judges there. Um, athletes are in competition uniforms, so on down the line. That does not mean that you use, you need to have all the pomp and circumstance that comes with uh, the state level event. You don't need to have an opening ceremony. You can have uh, the equivalent. I hate to keep going back to track, but there's some terminology there. We have what's called all comers meets, which are bare bones. Um, you show up, you have your competition, you leave. Uh, no awards, no lunch, no opening ceremony. Opening ceremony is get to your event, <laughs> the gun's about to start. Or in this case for you, it would be get, get ready for the first heat in the pool. Um, it's, those, that's fine. That counts as long as you have your uh, properly trained officials and so on down the line. You don't need to um, uh, go through everything. Um, that, that actually makes, that, that's where the difficulty is in running some of the larger events is all the extra stuff, not the competition itself. So that's totally fine to do events, even multi-area events, as bare bones. Um, totally fine. Uh, there is a sanction form that is required that needs to be signed or submitted by the area director. Uh, and really, uh, there's some ways that we can simplify that. Uh, but we say at least 30 days in advance. Um, we can make some exceptions to that if we need to. Bottom line, if you don't give us at least that much, you may not be able to, um, uh, we may not be able to help you advertise it. 
Uh, in some cases, we can assist with uh, some officials for some sports. I'm not sure what our availability to do that for aquatics is. Um, uh, the other is uh, loaning of equipment and such. Uh, that becomes much more difficult and much tighter uh, should we need to. Uh, these are the currently uh, scheduled aquatics qualifiers that we know of. Um, uh, no, as the note is at the top, um, not all of them are open to everybody, uh, but you have your contact information. Again, this is pulled from our sports calendar, which is um, sent out as a part of our biweekly area memo that goes out to area leaders. Uh, it's also posted uh, on uh, MySOMD and available for anybody. Uh, coaches can get access to that, uh, and you can download it on a regular basis that way. Um, uh, this is accurate. Melissa, as, this is as of this morning? Yes. I did okay. receive an email from um, Pam in Montgomery County saying that they want to have a qualifier as well, just waiting on dates and the sanction form for that. Right. Okay. So once I get that, I'll send that out. Okay. So we'll add them. Again, the the, the sports calendar is updated every two weeks, uh, and uh, we can uh, have that uh, available for you. Um, so please, if you are planning on hosting one, um, and I would say some of these uh, I think are done uh, in an evening. Um, I'm not sure which ones, uh, but um, there's all sorts of options that are available. Uh, it doesn't have to be. Um, you know, 200 athletes that you need to get into the pool. Um, they can be various sizes as well. Uh, I should also uh, say, I, I don't know that it's the case on any of these or which ones it would be, but some are offered uh, some events and not others. Uh, uh, some of the actual swimming events, but maybe not all the swimming events that are offered, um, and that can vary. Uh, Melissa, it looks like you had a question or a comment. Um. I just received a question saying that the Montgomery qualifier is on March, I'm sorry, May 20th. So I'll send that out as well. I'll update the sports calendar for that. Great, great. So um, just that simple. Uh, other stuff here. So resources, we mentioned MySOMD. Um, uh, you can uh, download stuff there. SpecialOlympics.org is where you can get the rules. Um, also, I noted at the beginning of the webinar, uh, that there is a coaches training school at Loyola Blakefield on Sunday, uh, 9 a.m. to roughly 11. We're, uh, I'm not, we weren't sure of the exact uh, conclusion, and there's still space, and you can register uh, using that link here. I know Melissa has sent stuff out to coaches already on this, but um, should be a great event. Uh, Matt and uh, Matt is the uh, the I think he's the aquatics director uh, or head coach at Loyola Blakefield, uh, and Rob he's is. Loyola. I'm sorry. He's the head swim coach at Loyola. Head swim coach. Uh, and Rob uh, has been our head official or technical delegate. I'm not sure which is his official title for, what, eight, ten years or more, right, Neil? Yes, Mike. He's, he's our immediate official. He's been in that capacity for at least that long. Yeah. So, uh, so questions, um, contacts here. Uh, as you notice, we're in the process of uh, bringing on board uh, two more uh, regional sport directors, um, but there is a contact there. Danielle uh, is excellent at getting the information or getting a question to whomever <coughs> um, uh, to get a response for you. Uh, and then uh, I'm not going to go through these slides other than to show you uh, this is all in there, but this is the new medical forum. Um, it is four pages, uh, so it's a little longer. Um, uh, this is the only page, this one in blue is the only page that the doctor needs to complete, uh, or I'm um, sorry, the medical professional, it could be a doctor, uh, and there's several others that are um, uh, qualified to do that. Uh, there is another page, to date I have not seen one of these used. This is, this is I guess, a fifth page, if you will, of, uh, of the form. This is if the doctor needs to send a referral um, or have the doc, have the athlete um, examined by another medical professional before they would sign off. Not saying that it's not used. Not saying that uh, you won't see it. Uh, but I don't. I have yet to see that being used. Uh, and that's not th th these forms uh, match what we use for. Um, have to submit for USA Games and World Games and and other events. And even with all of those, uh, I've yet to see this used. So don't let that worry. Uh, it is now down. The release is a single 
uh, signature um, for folks there. Um, and then for the volunteer application, um, we've updated that so it's now only two pages. Uh, note also up here, social security number is uh, optional. It is not required. Um, you can certainly put it in. Uh, if you'd like, it speeds things up a little bit, uh, but um, uh, it's certainly an option. And it is only two pages with a signal signature, single signature there. Uh, and the one reminder with that is if someone is under the age of 18, uh, actually one, um, if you are an adult completing it, you do need to provide a reference here. If they're 17 years or younger, they need to use the minor reference form, which is this third page. This is in addition to those first two pages, not in place of. So if it's somebody who's under the age of 18, there are actually three sheets that they would turn in. Uh, and this one requires um, uh, uh, live signatures. So I think uh, I'm not going to go through all the rest of this. Hopefully everybody's familiar with most of this. Um, there's the ASEP coach certification. So. Um, let me go back up to the questions. So that said, we have a couple minutes. If there's any additional questions that we didn't touch hey, on. Mike, hey, Mike. Mike. Yeah. Um, I did uh, pull up the rules for aquatic or swimming um, in regards to the equipment. So okay. if you want me to briefly uh, discuss that. Um, there's two sections, really. One, I don't think there's any issue. That's section 3.1.8. I don't think anybody has an issue with that, but I will read it in regards to equipment. No competitor shall be permitted to use or wear any device that may aid his or her speed, buoyancy, or endurance during a competition with the exception of the flotation events. This would include such items as webbed gloves, slippers, fins, etc. Goggles may be worn by the swimmer. Now to the more important question, which I think uh, was uh, Sean, in regard to the assisted um, or the flotation event that is also in the rules that's under section 3.2 equipment specifically 3.2.5 and that reads for flotation events each athlete is responsible for his or her own flotation device the device must be a body wraparound type such that if the athlete were to not be able to hold on to the device the device would still support the athlete with his or her face out of the water. Flotation devices such as inner tubes or floats that wrap around the arms are not acceptable for use at any time. So again, for reference, those are in the Special Olympics swimming rules. Under equipment, 3.2.5 is the rule for the flotation um, equipment. Thank you, Steve. For, the, uh, for those of you who don't know, uh, that's Steve Bennett, and um, Steve, even though I hired you, I don't remember exactly what your title is, but uh, so, um, uh, Steve oversees all of summer games and all of our multi-sport competitions uh, and has a decade's worth of experience in Special Olympics. So, But are there any other questions, uh, Melissa, anything typed in or anybody else with their hand up? Uh, nope. Looks like we're good. Okay, great. Um, so one last call, anybody? And okay. Well, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you for spending about an hour with us this evening. Uh, we'll get this out. Hopefully, many of you will be able to take advantage of the coaches' training uh, on Sunday uh, at Loyola Blakefield. Again, it's. I, I wish I could be there. I truly do wish I could be there. Uh, but we'll. We have a basketball tournament going on, so uh, hopefully it'll go really well. Uh, if you haven't already been doing so, um, be sure to check the Special Olympics coverage for the World Winter Games uh, that's going on on ESPN2. Uh, every night at 6, they've been doing coverage. They had the ABC special uh, on, um, on Saturday. Uh, the athletes are coming back Saturday night, and there'll be a closing special on ABC uh, on Sunday afternoon. Uh, but check your local listings. Uh, and... Uh, Thank you much. Uh, we look forward to seeing you throughout the season, um, and best of luck to all your swimmers. Uh, Neil or um, Melissa or Steve, any closing comments? Thank you all for your time. Good night, everybody. Thank you, everyone.